I'm the Executive Director of the Institute for Energy Economics and Financial Analysis. Uh, thanks for joining us this afternoon. This is a good die-hard crowd at 4 o'clock on a Friday. Um, our webinar today is uh, one of the series that we've done in advance of our upcoming conference, Energy Finance 2015. Uh, this afternoon we're going to talk about corporate finance, uh, led by Tom Sanzillo, who's our Director of Finance at IEFA has a wealth of experience having been in charge of investing uh, billions of dollars in pension funds for the state of New York, has worked on um, many different projects over the years involving uh, coal as well, and was one of the, the very first person to come to work for the Institute for Energy Economics and Financial Analysis when it began as a project of the Rockefeller Family Fund in 2007. Uh, hopefully you can all see the slides. Um, you will all be muted uh, during the presentation and actually during the webinar just to cut down on background noise. Uh, we are recording this, just so you know, and the recording will be available on our website beginning on Monday. Actually, all webinars, there was one on utilities and another one on natural gas, so they'll all be available on Monday. At the end of Tom's presentation, we'll have a question and answer session, and we're going to ask you to type your questions into the little box uh, on the right-hand side of the GoToMeeting panel there, and then we will relay those questions. Uh, so let's go ahead and get started, and uh, Tom, take it away. Okay. Uh, thanks, Sandy. Um, and thank all of you for attending this webinar and for those of you who will be um, um, with us in New York. I want to thank you for um, making the trip. Um, I hope it's all worth it. And um, we decided to do this particular webinar sort of uh, like we do most things uh, by suggestions of uh, people who are um, engaged with us. And they thought that maybe some background information going into the conference would be helpful to people who might be new or might be helpful to people who are new uh, to, the, to us in the finance world um, or maybe somebody just wanted to deepen some of their um, understanding um, things. So uh, let me start. Um, we are um, in the midst of an experiment. That's what I guess our organization is. Um, our bigger uh, experiment is whether or not we can change people's minds on climate, and that's the thing that we do together. Um, and then I think for the purpose of this webinar and for the purpose of the conference, what we're trying to do is to um, see how we can communicate our work and our experiences um, um, so we can help each other and improve our work, make a more effective movement. Um, so um, let me just jump off from there. Um, as I go forward in this, I just keep a couple of things in mind. One, I mean, um, we work from an assumption that all of us are talking to um, finance and government and media people and, and environmental regulators and what have you all the time. And many of those people are looking at our issues through their lenses. And a lot of the government and finance people and media people are not necessarily looking at it through a climate and environmental lens, but uh, tend to look at it through um, how they need to deal with their own lives and their own jobs. Um, and so what we're trying to do here today is to introduce some basic ideas of economics and finance that relate to um, energy, um, coal, oil, and natural gas. Um, and um, at the conference, we're going to have friends from um, uh, a number of different countries and um, the way that I explain, try to explain things is that um, there will be a lot of differences, cultural difference and all, but the one thing that we're really talking about here is money, and whether you call it a dollar or a rupee or a peso or a lira or a euro or a yen or lots of the other um, currencies, um, it all is about money and money seeks a kind of similar vocabulary which makes a very, sometimes what seems to be a very complicated and alien set of ideas actually pretty simple. Um, and so next slide, please. What we're going to try to do is run through some basic economic concepts, some basic financial concepts, and then talk a bit about how the corporations and governments that we're involved with look at projects, look at their own businesses, and how they analyze risk 
um, with the idea being that the more we know about the people that we're engaged in, the easier it is for us to come up with new ways um, to try to encourage them to change their decision making. And then I want to spend a good deal of time on the risks from popular opposition, because that's what we do. And it is a financial matter what we do, and I want to speak to that. And then uh, discuss a little bit about the purpose of the IEFA conference and what we're trying to do there. And uh, hopefully we can then do some questions. Anyway, um, next slide. I call this economic section the big picture for no particular reason, except we're dealing with issues of world and nation and markets and region. Um, we have a global economy, and, and money is invested all over the world. And it seeks um, a common set of rules. It seeks a common set of ideas. And the reason it does that is that um, investors want to be able to compare between countries um, and also against a you know, worldwide averages and, and things like that. Um, and national governments um, also care about the, the economy and uh, as part of their regions where they live. Um, and they have to think through their economies, which are usually made up of uh, more or less um, agriculture, manufacturing, energy, finance, retail, um, and the like. Um, and they're mixing and matching and trying to figure out how those markets produce the kind of development they need for jobs and taxes and to keep their countries together. Um, and then the concept of markets that we're going to use here is really, a, really just to see it as economic systems. Um, they tend to be linked across borders, um, and they um, and that allows for different rules and all kinds of competitive issues. And so it can seem kind of um, complicated, but we try to do some simple measures um, to make it um, easier to understand. And these are sort of the measures that the markets use. So you'll get some good ideas on this. Um, next um, uh, slide, please. Thank you. Um, so the question is, what is the economy? If we have to boil it down to a number um, or a series of numbers, we use the gross domestic product. And you'll see it used everywhere. Um, it's used to uh, understand um, the size of a country's economy. I'll get to that in the next slide. But the, um, and the, uh, and the how much it's growing or not growing. Um, and then what the type of um, um, economy it is. Is it more heavily energy? Is it more heavily agriculture? More heavily manufacturing, mining, retail, and the like? Each country is a little bit different um, based on natural resources and other development issues, location. Um, but the most important thing to any economy is growth. And that means uh, market profitability. And so we're going to look at um, profits from both a project point of view, like what we run across, mines, plants, uh, wells, um, um, uh, ports, uh, rails, and the like. Um, and those projects are carried out by corporations um, who you'll hear a lot at the conference about pure play corporations. That's a company that does one thing. Like, uh, it only mines coal, and that's it. Um, and there are integrated companies which, within an industry, like an energy industry, they may be a mining, they may have mining interests, they may have power plant interests, they may have rail interests for moving whatever it is they're moving, they may have port interests. So it's integrated. They do more than one thing in the uh, chain for that industry. And then diversified companies are companies like they may run a power plant and a peanut butter factory. Um, so they're uh, um, diversified. They do very different kinds of things. Um, but the critical um, economic factors for the extractive industries have really to do, when you're dealing with economics, is really to do how much reserves they have, you know, how big they are, what they think they can get out of the ground, um, where the supply and demand forces are, um, how much it costs for them to buy, for, to make stuff, um, can they compete um, against their competitors about on that side of it, and then who's the man who wants this stuff, um, you know, the, what country wants it, what communities in those countries want it. And coal is measured in tons. Oil and natural gas is measured in barrels. And then the liquefied natural gas measured in ba barrels. And uh, natural gas is measured in cubic feet. And the other key to the extractive industry is location, where the stuff is pulled out of the ground and where it's going to be used. And that has to do with transport. All 
you're looking at the economic chain there. Um, and the thing you're going to hear an awful lot about is price. Price of coal, price of oil, price of natural gas. That's set by some complicated market, uh, market forces. But, you know, in the end, cheap power is what household uh, budgets and businesses are run by. And uh, you'll hear an awful lot about that and why um, and how price acts as incentives in some ways. Anyway, um, you're also going to hear a lot about competition. And for us uh, people who are involved in coal, you'll hear about it within the coal industry. You'll also hear about it in natural gas and oil and the competition within there. And then the economic um, factors that you'll also hear about is competition between renewables and oil, renewables and gas, natural gas and coal and the like. Next slide, please. Um, this is just a, a quick view of what um, the um, gross domestic product looks like for each country. You'll see Australia, 1.6 trillion. That's trillion, and that's dollars I'm doing this in. And then you see how much they grew, grew over the last year. Um, most countries are growing uh, somewhat slower, some faster. Um, and you'll you know, take a look at China with a very large GDP and growing at a rapid rate. Um, um, India has a smaller GDP, but a uh, rapid uh, growth rate. And uh, typically in energy, when we're looking at energy, we're looking at, um, uh, when we look at growth rates, that sort of translates into whether or not there'll be more people and businesses turning on lights um, or using cars and what have you for the, fuel, for the oil and gas. Next slide, please. Okay, this slide and the next slide will be really just for your references. This is a this is an integrated organization, Adani, it's their corporate structure. They do coal ports, they do terminals, they do power plants and the like. Next slide, please. This is something you can go to a link on. This is a presentation by Cloud Peak Energy. They do one thing, they mine coal. And it's a pretty good presentation for understanding how a company, at least in the US, is presenting themselves to investors and to the public, and also what they're doing in the export area for those who are interested in that. It's a pretty informative one. Um, uh, next slide, please. So if we're looking at economics as the big picture, we're looking at the sort of factors outside the company, how the bigger markets are playing, what other industries are doing, what the, what the national finance looks like. Um, then finance, it's a little picture. It has to do with what's going on in an industry, in a company, and then down to the project level. And then how, and it, what, what we're really looking at when we talk about the economy is that broader picture. And then finance is about how the companies are positioning themselves um, in that broader economic scheme um, that's going on, the factors that are going up and down all the time. Every company in the world produces something, um, and how they account for it is really the area of finance. And uh, because there's a global dialogue, as I said before, uh, in business, conceptually, it's all the same. And I, I emphasize the similarity because I'm fully aware that by er in every country there's different laws, different accounting rules, different customs, different industries. Within industries, you'll find different ways of setting up the books, as we say. Uh, and then by company, you'll find various ways that independent auditors set up books. So it can get a little confusing. But I think this, with the root, the guts of it are the next slide, please. And here, what we, we're just trying to show is the three areas, revenues, expenses, and operating profits. So you get money in in order to, when you sell a product, um, it costs you money to put together. Um, and the um, that's called cost of production. You'll hear an awful lot about that. And so when the money in, the revenues, the coal sold, the power plants sold, the fees gotten at the ports, um, um, exceeds the money out, which is the expenses, you have a operating profit. Now the expenses on the operating profit have to do with what it actually costs to produce whatever it is. Um, and then the operating profit is one form of profit. It's what you have um, if, you know, f from your production process, so mine. Um, and that's the earnings that you have before you've paid your debt, before you've paid your taxes, before depreciation kicks in, before administration kicks in. So, so that that has to be a rather rich um, operating profit in order to make a go of it. Uh, next slide. 
And these are the ad the additional costs, or what's called uh, EBITDA, earnings before interest uh, tax, um, depreciation, and uh, administration. And in our extractive industries, there's usually some kind of royalties involved. Um, now, the key to these um, to the extractive industries is really the amount of debt they're running. It's a really important factor. Um, and what we have here on the income statements are interest um, on long-term debt, and you, th that amount is then deducted from the operating profits, and that you then uh, deduct taxes, royalties, depreciation, and the like, and you get a net income or what you might call a margin, um, uh, comprehensive income or loss. They, they're called a little bit differently, which is why I'm, being, I'm trying to give you different words. So in a sense, there's two kinds of profits here. Um, next slide. Now, the debt is very important. Um, how much you have to borrow, how much the companies have to borrow in order to build a mine, build a power plant. Most companies don't, don't pay for it out of cash. And so they go out and they, they raise it just as a person buying a house might raise a mortgage. Um, and what's the function of the debt? Well, it, it, you, it helps you build the assets, and the assets then, as we said, produce revenue, and that revenue is paid back. You pay back the debt, you pay back the profit, uh, you pay the profit to your shareholders and, and to the people running the company, or you don't if it's not working very well. And you're going to hear a lot these days um, at the uh, conference on over leverage. Um, that's when a company um, basically borrows too much and can't afford to pay back um, their debt or pay back their other expenses, and they are in trouble. And there are various ratings that occur as a result of all that. And, and you'll hear about the rating agencies who are in charge of sort of oversight of the markets. Next um, um, slide, please. Now, for us, we're going to start getting into here things that I think a lot of us are involved in, um, well, who gives them the money um, to build these projects that a lot of us find objectionable, uh, and, and, uh, unless they're building windmills and solar uh, stuff, in which case they're our friends. Um, anyway, there's private investment banks. Um, they sell bonds. You'll hear the terms of bonds, private equity, project-related financing, all that kind of stuff. And they're the ones you know pretty much, J.P. Morgan, Morgan Stanley, City, and the like, UBS. But there are also of course, local banks, uh, national banks, um, uh, national private sector banks, um, and uh, they too are involved in the uh, in the investment business. Um, and that's one group, and their motivation is profit. Um, that's what banks do. Um, and then there are public banks, also known as development banks, international financial institutions, um, usually where multiple countries come together, provide capital. Uh, to spur development, and their objective is much more policy oriented. They want to get the money back. Typically, they are loans, um, but they are also trying to um, build their um, economic systems in, in any given country. So it's economic strategy and policy as much as it is profit for them. Um, and that's where subsidies come from. And many subsidies come from, from although there's all kinds of others. Um, and then the companies usually put up equity, and that's uh, you'll hear a lot about that, um, stock or cash or assets. So usually you'll hear things like, well, you know, the equity is going to be 10%, and the borrowing is 90%, or something like that. And what you learn is that there's usually a combination of all three of these in many energy projects. Um, some, so sometimes there's just a private inv private investment, but you'll often find some form of public involvement in, in most of these um, as well. Um, next slide, please. So when they're assessing whether or not to, when the companies or the governments are assessing whether or not to um, get involved in a project, and similarly when a bank or a lending institution looks at whether or not they want to go forward with a project that's been brought to them, um, they um, begin to look at the, you know, the potential profits and loss um, of a, of a, um, uh, of a project or a company. They're looking at both, usually. The company, whether or not it's a profitable company, has done well in the past. The project analysis is whether or not the specific project works. They look for risks. Next, uh, um, top, next slide, please. And what they're doing is they're saying uh, the, the public and private corporations are driving new projects. 
they are they have a similar objective of growth, economic growth. Um, and um, as I said, there's a difference in their perspectives. One is more profit oriented, the other is more development and policy oriented. And they're doing this as part of broader corporate strategies, broader banking strategies, broader utilities strategies, broader mining company strategies. And they do this through a series, the, the private sector does it through a series of corporate parents and subsidiaries. You'll hear a lot about that. And they are looking to the capital markets, which is another way of saying they're looking to banks as, and other um, uh, uh, ways of raising capital. And they, these projects are usually done to help the goals of the country or city or state that, that they're involved in. Um, next slide, please. So when they're looking at risks, what are they doing? Well, um, um, everything has to make a profit. Um, and the thought is that if they invest money and they put in the time and the effort, that that effort should return, um, cover the costs of the uh, expenses that I talked about, the um, operating expenses and the interest and taxes and the like. Um, and then they have to have a profit left over, which spurs more investment. That's what tells them there is a market. If they can show they can cover costs, pay debt, um, and still retain a profit, um, but there are always risks. Every project has risks. So they put in the money and they really don't know in the end, they have to manage a lot of problems and that's where we come in. Um, there are economic problems. Suppose the GDP doesn't grow the way people said. That means economically it's very unlikely that there'll be as many um, people turning on lights for the purposes of electricity. Um, the, there are market, all kinds of, uh, of market risks uh, related to um, demand and supply, for example. Um, uh, and those risks are um, if, a, if a potential customer disappears um, or, or a customer changes their, their policy as to whether or not they would use coal, for instance. Um, there are all kinds of supply side risks. If prices go up, mines collapse, um, you know, uh, and the like. And then, of course, there's price risk. Price is not always, is not ever really controlled by the companies. So the, the things go up and down. These are markets that set them. Um, there's some relationship to cost of production, but then there's broader supply and demand issues. Prices can go down as they are now, or they can go way up, um, which is uh, both beneficial and causes some problems, which you'll hear about. Um, and so the economic, the decision making for economics at a corporation and for to, to, is, is, is the business leadership, the vision of the company, the policy, the CEO and the board saying, well, we now see this economy um, going in this direction. Should we invest in coal? Should we invest in natural gas? Should we invest in, um, in renewables? What do we do here? That's their job, to set that broader strategy, uh, the CEO and the board. The finance decisions, how the assets get allocated, whether or not revenue expenses are going to be met. That's more of your, although the board is involved, it's much more of a management um, function. It's much more of an execution function. So you're looking there. The finance issues are really related in many ways to the good management of the company. Um, the legal and regulatory risks that they face are, um, they have to do well. We a lot of us know this. Um, you know, is the, is the company a good citizen? Are they good partners? Are they complying with the law? Are they um, dealing with their um, uh, customers well? Um, and uh, if not, they can run afoul of the law. Project costs can go up, or the laws can change, which is what a lot of the work that we're engaged in is in changing and uh, changing and enforcing um, uh, regulations related to public health and, and the environment. So um, those, that's a real risk. That's a real financial risk. And then, I, and, and this is where I want to spend a good deal of time, this traditional concept of political risk. And the traditional concept of political risk in finance has to do with um, usually emerging markets, emerging nations, where the risks are things more related to um, nationalization of an investment, you know, um, political violence, uh, the, the, the seizing of their property by um, um, terrorists, let's say, or the murdering of uh, corporate officials or kidnapping and things like that. It's a, it's a, uh, that's the typical political risk which could cause problems and you know, put a project out of business. Um, what we look at um, 
as we're doing our analysis is we look at a cumulative risk. Um, very few of the projects, very few of the work that we do, there's one like silver bullet that kills it, although right now price is a pretty big one um, on killing projects all over the world. But it's usually some combination of weak finances, weak, you know, some G GDP problems, uh, um, you know, uh, the specter of uh, new regulations, um, existing litigation, and so and they and you can put together a good argument, a good public argument that says they, they can't do this, they can't do this project that doesn't meet standards, it doesn't meet law, it doesn't meet common sense. Um, next um, slide, please. Um, so when we you know, understand those particular risks, the economic, the financial, and the legal risks, um, there's also a risk that they don't take a whole lot of uh, um, um, can't really pay much attention to until it happens. And that's risk of public opposition. That's largely what we're doing. Um, and that has a lot to do with their reputations, um, broadly understood. Next slide, please. Um, now, what we do, what, what goes on here is every act that either the companies or the governments take sends signals. They send signals to corporate employees, they send them to governments, they send them to market stakeholders. And so their actions, their policies, program investments, they all are sending out messages and they try to um, you know, spin that message, if you will. And, um, and that's because our society attaches positive and negative connotations to these actions. You know, if you're sanctioned, then fined. Um, that's a negative if you're, you know, you've got a program and a policy and uh, everything looks like all the players are working together, and that's a positive for their thing. And it's part, becomes part of the brand of the company, it becomes part of their profile, and in our world, I think all of us on this phone probably know, it's instant communication, which means an instant brand. Um, and so it's, it can be very simple. All government uh, and success and corporate successes builds the reputation, and all of it the negatives hurt their reputation. Next. So why do they care about their good reputation? Because it helps them grow. Because the corporation leaders get high salaries when things are going good and not so good uh, when they're not. Um, politicians like um, a good reputation because it gets them elected. Ministers, uh, um, their power positions are relative to their popularity also in many countries and so um, secretaries in the, in the uh, United States they're called. Um, and you get um, from public opinion and editorial support for a business gets them can good consumer relations um, and uh, people want to do business with them and it also gets, and this is the key in my view, um, it gets them public benefits, access to public and private benefits that enhances profits. Um, if you think about it, a new law that puts a competitor out of business or, or provides a subsidy or, or a new regulation that is weaker or whatever, all affects that income and expense, that revenue and expense model that I was talking about, and it affects profits. Um, so the approval of investors and banks um, when shareholders are interested, they're buying your stock. It raises its price. When banks are interested, they will give you a loan. Um, and I just this week, Peabody Energy, the U.S. asked for a loan. They're in such bad financial shape that the banks are giving them a very hard time where they would usually rubber stamp them if in a business that's doing well. Um, that's um, a lot of the work of the, some of the people on this phone. Um, and um, you also, when you have a good reputation, you get favorable regulatory outcomes. You get favorable financing, mostly from the government. Those are public benefits. Um, and you also get political protection. And uh, you get political protection over markets. I mean, part of the reason that the coal and the fossil fuel industry does so well is because the, uh, the political systems have basically uh, put um, pushed back against the wind and solar and efficiency for many years. Um, you get weaker oversight when you get political protection. Um, you get leverage over competition um, with preferential treatment. Um, and you get leverage over us, opposition, when you have a good reputation. So that is all very important to them. Next slide, please. Uh, moving along, okay. Um, anyway, so what undermines corporate reputations? 
the biggest thing that uh, uh, hurts them are financial losses. And this goes right to the CEOs and the boards. They don't like it when their stocks decline. They don't like it when they have to cut dividends. They don't like it when projects get delayed or canceled. They can get fired over these things. They don't like it when closing facilities. They don't like the term shrinkage. Um, they like growth. They like stocks going up. They like dividends rising and on time. Um, they want their projects done when they want them because it costs less. Um, and also what happens is when those things go wrong, it changes the perceptions in the business world. Rating agencies downgrade rather than upgrade. Um, it's a whole series of events. You could have on the public sector, you could have hearings, investigations, and reviews. All of this tells the world that something is wrong and it has potential for imposition of new costs, which hurts both the company and the projects that are involved. Um, there are also violations of law that hurt company reputations, exposés in the media, which some of us have been involved in, loss of allies. This is a really big uh, factor where a business ally um, no longer sees a good corporate relationship and leaves. The utilities in the United States, for example, are, have been moving away from the coal industry in unprecedented ways. Many are still involved, but they nevertheless are moving in unprecedented ways away. There are professionals who go in the other directions, politicians who go in the other direction and give us some support occasionally, editorials who may change their mind, um, regulators who at one point maybe trusted the industry don't anymore. Um, and then the other thing that undermines um, a corporate reputation is breaking public promises, prices, commitments to communities, environmental agreements, legal contracts, labor disputes. All of this goes to the, to the overall view of the company and those who are, t you know, who are trying to push some of the projects that we're involved in. And of course, unfair advantage. Um, through political contributions tied to what I would call bad behavior um, is also a way that if they get caught, it, it hurts their, um, it hurts their um, reputation. Um, next slide, please. I'm going to try to go a little faster to finish up. Um, the, what undermines government reputations, they're somewhat similar but somewhat different. And uh, here, mostly the unman just like the company is losing, the unmanageable government finances is something that um, political leaders, <clears throat> governmental leaders uh, don't like. They don't like tax increases. They don't like expenditure cuts. They don't like weak economies. They don't like credit downgrades. Um, they don't like their programs to be failures. Um, well, they don't like it to be known that they're failures. Um, they don't like cost overruns. All of this tells everyone that something is wrong um, in, the, uh, in the process and begins to weaken. Um, if it's a project that we're involved in, it begins to weaken the project. Uh, they also, also have leadership crises, um, polls, scandals, elections, and the like. Um, and so um, they run the same kind of uh, reputational risks that the, uh, that the other, um, that the corporations do. And those are the kinds of things that we tend to raise. Um, next slide, please. When it works, you get something like this. Um, this is a uh, CEO girling, uh, head of Trans Canada, pushing the Keystone Pipeline. And his view um, to the press in 2011 was they, had, they could never have predicted that that project, the Keystone Project, was going to become such a lightning rod on development issues that it was raised to such a level. And that was because of the um, active organizing of people and the willingness to use all the levers, many of the levers that I just talked about, and then some. Um, and that's the point. There, this has to all be done in a, in a creative fashion. Um, next slide, please. Um, so what we're trying to look at when we do this, and you'll hear at the conference, is we look at the economic issues. We're looking at rising GDP, market prices, profits, stocks, cancellations. And you should be looking at those same kinds of things and those same discussions and saying to yourself, can the, how can this info be used in our work? And then if we developed it, um, how do we begin to use it to influence the decision makers? Who are the decision makers? And we um, engage them to uh, make. And throughout the conference, you'll be hearing a mix of professionals who are talking about some of the more technical things that I've been dealing with. Uh, markets and tonnage and things like that and uh, um, profits and losses. 
Um, and then you're going to hear a lot from advocates, you know, um, um, who are engaged in campaigns, some of whom are using the finance work, some of whom are thinking it through, um, seeing if it'll work. Next slide, please. So, I mean, what we're trying to do here is to say may, they, maybe there's another angle in the climate fight. We found that the energy work, I'm sorry, the economics and finance work helps with them, helps with message. It becomes it helps, uh, an, another series of messages we can send. It helps to build political allies that we didn't have before, perhaps. Um, it pushes back on our adversaries in ways that they maybe didn't expect, like the, Mr. Gerling. Um, and we also are... Um, um, have an assumption, and that could be the uh, uh, crazy assumption. We think we can make progress anywhere. Um, progress is, uh, in the ideal sense, killing the projects and trying to get more renewables and what have you um, invested uh, in. Um, but on the other hand, progress is also the fight. <clears throat> the fight next time. Um, a fight. We find we found instances where we were fighting one coal plant and we were losing on it, but other, others got closed as a result of it, or um, mining fights that then tripped up companies and they wound up having to change policies generally. But maybe we didn't win the fight. Um, there's all kinds of things that that happen. Uh, interim victories, you might say, um, or victories that we didn't expect. Um, and the main final point is this doesn't work. The finance work doesn't work without broader campaigns. It doesn't, you know, so if there are, it, it requires active uh, environmental organizing and climate uh, organizers who are looking at projects, looking at policies and saying, we can change this. Yeah, yeah, we can definitely change this. We can provide some analysis and you can develop some of your own after you really learn this. Um, and the analysis, we say, must have legs. In other words, we have to f have a way to like get it out there. So we often work with people to find new venues, new ways of putting things out so that the movement can um, uh, be more effective in uh, us reaching our goals. Um, I think that's it for right now. That's the last slide? Yes, the last slide. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, and the, the appendix, which I meant to introduce before, the appendix on this is a listing of all the countries um, that are, are people who are going to be at the conference and their various Securities and Exchange Commissions. Those are the people who govern financial um, presentations and uh, who the companies are responsible for at least filing information with. Um, and they're usually useful. Um, they're not usually project information, but they tell you a lot about the corporations, about the industries we're involved in, and the like. So, thanks. Yeah, that's a great source to have. And I know at least in the U.S. one, when you look at the filings, you find out things like, is somebody suing that company for something else, and then you often can get a lot of information out of looking at lawsuits and that kind of thing. Or is that company being sued <laughs> also? Well, great. Well, thank you, Tom. Um, we now are open for questions. And if people would just, if anybody has a question, just go ahead and type into the little box um, on your GoToMeeting panel. And we'll give folks a second to do that. You want to? Uh, let's see. I don't know. Everybody's spellbound here. Might take a while. There we go. Muriel. OK, a question from Muriel, who wants to know, for the big oil and gas companies like Chevron, where does their project, where does their project financing usually come from? Um, the larger companies um, are norm, well, mostly self-financed on projects, um, although they are they are heavily involved with uh, with banks on um, on moving their money around and leveraging what they have. Um, but if you were to look at uh, most oil and gas projects, you'll find, for the big ones, um, you'll find uh, they're largely company financed, although not completely. The smaller oil and gas companies, it's a mix of uh, banks and uh, you know what they can raise. Um, but there's a lot of bank, a lot more banks than the smaller ones. Um, the different function the banks serve for Chevron than they do for, like, a Chesapeake. 
Okay, good. Do you want to talk about uh, one thing that comes up and something else I was just reading about things like that is explaining what underwriting means. That's a term that gets thrown around all the time. Yeah, um, under, um, uh, I, I have to refrain from what, uh, some things. But anyway, <laughs> underwriting has to do with um, <laughs> in order for a company to get a loan or to get a credit and what have you, um, they go to a bank or a or a, a, a or if or they go to a bank um, to ask for it, or they go to investors. In order to get a sort of an independent verification, you might have other banks um, or um, consultant firms or whatever do what's called due diligence. Um, and the due diligence is um, done by underwriters, people who, uh, by underwriting it, they are essentially v v vouching for the um, the uh, different levels of validity of the investment statements being made um, um, about the investment. So the under so J.P. Morgan will underwrite um, stock deals, and they will also be selling them, uh, uh, which is a big conflict. But they they do it. So Morgan Stanley does the same. The larger ones, um, and you'll find investment houses that specialize in coal, oil, and gas, as well as smaller ones who come in and underwrite deals. Um, I think there's been a couple of questions, so let me, there's one yeah. that's up okay. for us. So Great. Let's keep going. So there's a follow-up to that first one, which is... Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, Where there's about I... three or four more here. Okay. For the Galilee Basin projects, it does not... I got it. Okay. I see. Well, I'm going to read it because not everybody might see it. So for the yeah. Galilee Basin projects, it does not seem like a lot of credit ratings have come out for the debt financing for these projects. Why not? Right. Um, well, they haven't asked for them. Um, the uh, the uh, I mean, probably if they asked for them, they wouldn't get very good ones. Um, so what happens is they will normally ask for credit ratings on projects when they feel ready um, to do so. If you if you've listened, some of the responses to Tim Buckley's work is well, you know, well we're not there yet, but we're putting the pl the pieces in place and. Uh, and so they haven't gone uh, there yet. Um, my tendency is to think that as those deals, be, the perception um, becomes more speculative, that they may do a lot of private financing with very large people like the Adanis, like, um, um, uh, I forgot her name, Hancock. Um, and, uh, so they, they may do more of those. and. Uh, and they may go to banks, but in the in the case of the Galilee, a number of the large international banks have already said they don't want to do them, um, independent than their own economic analysis of, of things. So they're not asking for the ratings um, yet because they don't feel prepared to go to the capital markets. The projects are being financed in-house by um, the companies um, on the development costs. Um, okay, thanks. Here's a, a two-parter. We'll start with the first part. Is it fair to say that both both a lack of policy action as well as the specter of policy action increases risk? Um, the the um, well, I'm not sure what you mean by the lack of policy. Yes, the lack of policy uh, the lack of policy action. Um, can be you know helpful to the companies because um, then they can walk all over people. So um, I'm not quite sure if, that, if I'm getting the right meaning of that. But anyway, the specter of policy action definitely increases risk. In fact, <coughs> I would say that when in the organizing work in the United States on coal plants, that there were a lot of financial matters, construction pricing, coal pricing, and all that. Um, that caused their cancellation, but it also occurred during the course, during the several year course when Congress was considering a carbon tax, uh, which never was implemented, but that the mere specter of it um, um, uh, prevented many of the public service commissions and the banks from going forward because they didn't know what they knew there would be a rule. They didn't know what it was. Um, so that that yes, the answer is yes. Um, and um, can we assume oil company? Can we assume? Oil companies at conference, trying to figure out how much to talk about strategy. I think, I, I, I don't know what the companies are going to send, but you never know. Um, I guess the rule is the rule that we usually have, which is anything you don't want in the newspapers, um, don't talk about. But 
Um, there are a lot of side meetings that are going on at this conference to, for just that purpose, um, where we'll be meeting in smaller groups. And I think for our oil discussions, the, the Friday we're going to meet for just that reason. But I'm pretty don't care what they know, but I think I probably shouldn't be so. <laughs> yeah, and you know, we, we do bring people with other perspectives to the conference, especially as presenters, on purpose. I think that was one of your points in the slides, is we do that because we want to hear what they yeah. have to say and, um, and how they are thinking about the work that they do, and that's one of the valuable things about getting us all in the room together for, for the large sessions. Yeah, and I do want a lot of messages to go back, that we're permanent, we're here, we're sophisticated. That's all a part of uh, public accountability risk. If you're a permanent force, if you are skillful, if you have resources, if you um, have all those things, you are um, a force to be reckoned with um, in the press and, and in the political circles, in the courts, um, and that's really part of what this conference. We I I like to just send out the agendas to people to to, to show them what we're up to. The right. coal industry. <laughs> right. We've even invited the coal industry a couple of times. They don't come anymore. Um, yeah. And and then after the conferences are over, just so everybody knows, we then put up on our website all of the powerpoints and everything, and you can see the ones from past years if you go to the About section of our website and then click on Training. Yeah. Um, okay, well, we've got a few more questions, so we're going to fit these in. Like Wall Street, some big traditional names, GE, are starting to invest in renewables, yes. What factors are causing them to do this now, and how will it impact the traditional fossil fuel companies and the energy picture in general? Well, on the um, what's going on is, um, there is sufficient in the coal industry. There is it's, it's sufficiently in the U.S. Uh, in trouble um, that um, public service commissions and state governments are are asking for renewable investments. Um, the public generally is asking for renewable investments. The banks don't like the risks uh, generally, um, although they will help their coal customers and their utilities who are involved. Um, but it's been losing money um, uh, on that side of the fossil fuels. Um, and natural gas they're also investing in, which is not a great thing. Um, so the investments, the investments which used to be in coal, since we were mostly a dominant coal country, um, are going now into renewables and natural gas and some energy efficiency because the markets are shifting. Wall Street's made up its mind on coal that this is not the first choice anymore. Um, and uh, are causing them to do this now and how it impacts traditional fossil fuel. I think the thing that we can do most is stop the bad stuff and then um, it doesn't mean that good stuff will happen inevitably, but it means the capital markets and the politicians have to figure out how to meet the need anyway. Um, and I think that's the strength that we have. Um, and uh, so that's, you know, it's a long haul. Um, and it's not um, clean how it happens. Um, what are the best sources to research investors in a particular project in our region? Do you have time to explain some methodology for such research? It depends on, you know, what kind of a project it is and where. Um, we have, um, we're always willing to help there. Um, if there is a, uh, if it's a, if it's a, if it's a company that's traded on the stock market, there's usually more information that we can get. Um, or if there are filings with public service commissions, there's usually more information that we can get. But some of the ones that are not transparent, um, private equity funds, and that we've been able to get some of it. You know, we've been able to get some bond information. Uh, we're getting better at it as we go forward, um, and so. We would look to help you if you if you want, but there are you know we can we can pretty much I mean some of the private equity things you can't find, um, um, but you can get something you know there's always a public file filing somewhere that we can get something out of it, um, and um, and we should be able to find investors in almost every project. Yeah, and one thing we learned this year is if you know anybody who works or was a, like a business student or someone who has access through their work to certain uh, subscription research services, um, those can be very, very helpful. They're quite expensive, but for example, we subscribe to SNL, which is a, a amazing uh, research service on energy. We're always happy to look stuff up for that. There's things called the Bloomberg Terminals, which 
uh, many um, investors have or business schools have that you can find a tremendous amount of money of information but most of us as nonprofits have never had access to these before and so that it, it's uh, it's amazing what you can find if you can get access to that stuff through friends or allies um, yeah, we had a question come in the that US New York State so um, in particular so we're, yeah the, I think it makes a um, and New York State's an interesting one, not just because I live here, it's because it's also the the home of Wall Street. So there is, um, you can get, you can probably get some information here uh, in the government uh, as well. I just don't know the nature of the project, um, but we can talk about it for sure. Yeah, we're always happy to help people with these research suggestions too. Um, we start, when we had a statement come in or a question that seems to have only come here, which is that um, uh, what are the penalties? for companies that lie to the SEC and uh, those kind of violations? I think that was the question from Naki, right? Yeah. You're yeah. Not high enough. Um, and, <laughs> uh, so, I mean, here, here's the way you, you have to look at some of this. The first thing um, is that um, there are a lot of securities laws. There are a lot of violations of them. Um, and they are largely disclosure rules. They can be fined, they can be prosecuted, they can be um, told to correct their stuff. Um, um, those are the, the general kinds of things. On disclosures, the or the agency can change policies and institute that kind of stuff. What you you know, it is not a very pro investor agency. It's really sort of controlled by the corporations. Um, and so you have to use it strategically. You can, if you can get them to open an investigation or send letters or cause issues, then I think that's a very valuable organizing tool. Um, they don't do the work for us. We have to continue to do the work. Um, we have to continue to do the exposés. They may invest resources in doing investigations in extraordinary situations. We've tried many. We've gotten one or two, and even after they do the investigations, it's not always um, it's not always great because there's a you know they have a phalanx of corporate lawyers going in. There are people lobbying in Washington. Um, it's a fight, but it's worth the fight um, if we see it, and it's a venue that we can use and. You know, we have to marshal our resources, but I think, it's, like I said, it's part of a broader, if it's part of a broader strategy, it probably makes some sense. If it's the only strategy, I wouldn't recommend it. Um, um, you know, I just wanted to add uh, this, another thing on that question of how do you research uh, finances and of particular projects. I did a post on our website a couple of weeks ago that's a, sort of some recommendations on how to do that kind of research, and if you just, like, look up... Uh, Sandy Buchanan on the website and look up the commentary. There's a, a couple of posts there that might be kind of a outline for how to do some of that research. Um, what else do we have? Do we have a couple other questions here? Or we can send you that link to uh, Carol. Do we get Carol's question? Carol Chuck. Oh, that's the resources from Carol. Carol, I can send you a link to that too. Okay, New York State in particular. I think we're getting there. I don't know if there's any other. Any other questions that have come in? Any last it's five still. typing? All right. Well, thanks, everybody. It's a long day on a Friday afternoon. We appreciate your um, attention here. And uh, we're looking forward to seeing many of you in New York uh, in a little more than a week. <laughs> thanks, Tom. That was terrific. Thank you very thanks. much, everybody. Thanks for sharing that link, Adam. Yeah. Okie doke. Bye-bye. <laughs>